Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to another uh, episode of Three Consulting Amigos. Today, what we're going to do is uh, Entrepreneur, Mag Entrepreneur Magazine recently did a um, an article on the 10 biggest challenges that small businesses face. And part of what we thought would be helpful, we've been talking about family businesses, and we're going to kind of go through the first five and discuss how, um, first of all, how they affect small business, and then what you can do to mitigate them. Uh, so having said that, uh, Ron, since you found these, you want to you wanna begin by kind of giving us an overview on what you thought was important about these? Well, I think I think the importance is is that uh, it was something that published in Entrepreneur uh, Entrepreneur Magazine, and um, this particular author and obviously the editors, you know, felt as though there were things that were legitimate, and so it gives us it gives us a, a you know, just a little bit of a sort of a current current event thing on what's going on with small business right now, and. Uh, um, it's hard to find very much in terms of small businesses that, uh, of the current events that are affecting them the most um, and uh, in, in, in an article format or on the, on the web. And I found, it, I found it to be pretty, pretty interesting, the first two or three particularly. And um, so I think they are concerns. Each one of these is a concern of a small business. Um, what, what the article doesn't do which I think we'll do today is that it's done by a journalist. It's not, it has not been commented on by people who have been there, done that and have the, you know, hundred years combined experience that we have. Uh, and so I thought it would be interesting to contrast what we feel about each one of these. And maybe we can throw out a few solutions if we have them at the same time. No, it sounds good. Um, Great. Ed, do you have any thoughts on it? Since you, no, uh, I think this is really a good continuation from our last three or four meetings on family businesses. And so what's the latest uh, challenges they have based upon trends that are going on right now that they have to maneuver around to keep their business alive? Yeah. You know, and, and I see challenge one here, and I'm going to bring it up and so we can kind of talk about it directly. It's that the ability to transition to a digital first world Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, what's what's your take on that and why? Now, I'm not sure whether they made these challenges in terms of uh, priority. This is one through 10 or it's just a list of 10. Yeah, I, I, I don't, yeah, I'm not sure either. And uh, when I went through it, it's not the priority I would use. Um, but regarding the digital first, uh, we've I think we've used that term. We did a digital uh, a micro giants uh, digital show i don't know six months ago or so um but this particular piece gave me a little bit of pause i thought wait a minute they're talking about communications i better look this up because i really thought this was a broader topic well if you take a look at google and you put in digital first you've got all kinds of stuff and everybody's just talking about their own take if then if you say define the digital first you find even the definitions are not very consistent. So um, I guess my 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 uh, thought was, and it was a little bit of a learning exercise, my thought is that this idea of digital first has become a catchphrase, first of all. And it means to communicators, um, consider publishing digitally before you before you go to the traditional media. Now that's that's the marketing, advertising, publishing universe. But then on the other hand, it, it also means other things in other places in, in, in manufacturing. It sort of means, well, you're, you're, gonna, you're gonna do a lot of automation and you're gonna use digital input and control systems in order to do that. Um, in terms of um, design processes, that really includes uh, a methodology that is is sort of versus paper systems or physical systems, sort of a paperless outlook. Um, and, and so, I mean, that really gave me a little bit of pause. We, we kind of have to define it. And, and so I just took a shot here and I kind of defined it this way. It's, it's sort of the outlook that all business practices are initiated using computer driven systems and communications um, in up to up to date mobile and wireless technologies. In other words, it's really a 
the the idea that you think about things from a digital perspective as opposed to falling back on your old folder system or right. or your manual system or taking paper from one desk to the other or how, however you know a company happens to be doing it um and so it's a it's as much a mindset for small business people i think as it, as anything else um and of course then the question is well how do they do it but um how about a couple comments for from you guys before we get into how to do that well i i think uh the age group that's really impacted by this transition that's going on are the older people which would include the three of us <laughs> you can't do anything anymore by just getting on the phone calling somebody first of all nobody answers their phones anymore <laughs> and everybody directs you back to the website because they want to force you back into some type of a digital transaction mm -hmm. and um, I, I don't know about you guys but i got eight pages of of uh, various passwords and user identifications <laughs> and you know um, there's so a digital there's a digital solution to that ed no well, i know there probably is but <laughs> the bottom line is and we, I, I had this i had a meeting with one of my clients this week and um, most of us are my age and uh, we're talking about exit planning and buy sell agreements etc and then there's a young kid in there who is uh, probably not that young but he's still he's 35 years of age he does things completely different than the rest of us mm -hmm. so i i guess they're they're betting on that the older guys will pass on and then the newer people will take over and right now i think you kind of need both to be able to transition through this period of time so you're servicing your customers and I, and I think if you rely too much on the digital side, I think sometimes you lose track of your customers. And as we all know, the number one priority of any business is to satisfy customers. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that, you know, that's a good point. Ed. You know, I think the, the observation you made is that sometimes relying too heavily on digital, uh, you know, actually closes an opportunity or a door to your customers. So, you know, it could be dangerous because you're assuming things are happening and that, in fact, may not be at all the case. And as Ron has said over and over again, you know, know your customer. And I think uh, for all of us, it's easier said than done, you know, and to your point, Ed, can you pick up the phone and actually talk to them or will you hit here, please leave your message? <laughs> you know. Yeah. yeah, no, that's that, that's really, really true. And my my sense is, is that while digital first is sort of maybe a mantra, that ought to stir a frame of mind change. Um, it can also go too far. And, you know, we can come up with all kinds of, of um, cases where especially, you know, the say 60, 60 year old and above is going, no, no, I just, I would just like to call somebody on the phone and talk and have them fix the problem instead of making me go through some sort of a process that maybe somebody likes it, but I don't. Um, and it and those processes aren't that good yet. I think that's the interesting thing is, and so you, you've got it, both of you have it right. If you think customer first, then you can think, okay, how does digital work for the customer first? Some customers do want it. And, um, you know, I've, I've seen and, and been involved in some pretty successful operations that have, have done that. Uh, the, the dairy that I've worked with for 30 years um, has just done a phenomenal job. We've gone from three or four percent using cell phones to change orders uh, for weekly delivery to in, in a range of 75 or 80 percent that do it now. Mm -hmm. Well, that means we had to completely redesign all the computer systems. We had to redo the interfaces for for mobile. Uh, they call them mobile first. Um, and, and we did that at a very large expense that is continuing to this day that many businesses could not afford to even do. But along the way, we got efficiencies. But you know what? We didn't start with this giant idea. We had to build on it. We had to find a system that was a digital system. We had to find the one that was compatible with the Internet. We had to find one that we could use SQL with, which is a universal sort of online um data, database system so i mean all these things have to come together slowly we didn't really perfect the mobile until the last thing see 
And some people are saying, well, you do that first. It's like, well, good luck if it doesn't hook to anything in the back. Right, right. You've got a door and you got no building here. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I think if you're a, a small business, you have to think about the digital revolution. You have to become savvy of uh, digitizing your business, but I think you have to have everything within balance. And I think it's a good opportunity to find businesses that haven't approached this opportunity yet and take it to the next step and uh, would be an opportunity to, to grow that business. Mm -hmm. Well, and to your, to your point uh, about, you know, serving the customer, I was um, working with our um, credit union here and, and their first question to me on the feedback was, do you want an email? Do you want a text? Or would you like us to phone you? You know, which is consistent with what you're saying, Ron, you know, they're, they're really moving in a direction so that, depending on who the customer is, you know, they're trying to serve the customer as opposed to just arbitrarily picking one size for all. Right. And that I, I think that is the right approach and um, trying to assume that, you know, that you, you, you know, how the customer wants it is, is really a, f a fool's errand. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and companies that have an existing um, philosophy and an, an existing product line can really make bad bad mistakes. I'm working. Uh, I I bought. I I had to buy five separate controller systems for my watering system here, and um, I it was ridiculous to try and do this. You know, to operate it manually because you're walking all over the place to try and figure out where they are. So I put in digital ones from Orbit. Well, I mm. got them all going and connected, and it's really has a lot of innovation. It's really like, you know, and it's, it's just made my life easier because I use my cell phone to be able to determine way more information than I had before, turn them on, turn them off, all that kind of stuff. Except there's one little problem. Over a period of four or five months, they've all lost the connectivity. Oh, no. <laughs> so now what we have is a lot of rain in Southern California. And, and sprinkler's my going. sprinkler's still going. Oh, boy. <laughs> So it just continues to work on the old schedule. And even though their technology says they're going to do rain delays and they, they do and they work. I mean, they're hooked up to the national weather system. Right, right. It's pretty, it's a pretty ambitious project. The, the problem is I had to go unplug all of the systems to get them to stop watering. <laughs> and so now I'm running around trying to... Um, get these things, you know, to stop, and then I'm trying to get them to restart, and they they don't connect with the internet, and I can't I can't get the Bluetooth to work. Now <laughs> I plug them back in; they go back to the old schedule. Right. It's like oh. these guys sabotage themselves by trying to do too much too fast, and I called them on Monday with a plea for help. Right. Today's Friday. Yeah, you haven't heard from them since. No, no. <laughs> yeah. Their yeah, average going. response, their average response, is a day and a half to two days. And this particular time, everybody must be having the same problem because they all aged out or something. The whole, right, right. the whole country's watering when they shouldn't be. I don't know what's going on, but um, you know, this causes me to think I'm going to completely change companies. Well, and I think I think what it, what it, the other thing it's done is when te technology works, it's great. When it doesn't, it's horrific. <laughs> it's really bad. It's really bad. Well right. said. Well yeah. said. Yeah. So um, let's let's talk a little bit about the second one, which is really kind of intriguing to me: lack of in-person networking events. And you know, we've we've talked so much about that. I think one of the biggest challenges, and I don't want to get ahead of myself on terms of these challenges, but all of us have operated a small business and we realize it's not a full-time job. It's a full life job. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think it's interesting that um, this particular uh, journalist that happened, happened to put these together and there, they may not be based on importance, but the two, those two are, are counter counter to each other. It's like, we, we can't get digital first fast enough, yet at the same time, we want to just go back to the old ways. Um, and, and I find, I mean, I, I see what we're doing right now today as a digital, a digital solution to getting together. We right. would never be able to physically get together uh, and do, do this kind of a program every week if we were doing it physically. 
Um, right. We, we all spend a lot of time on, on Zoom or, or some other online program. I find it to be incredibly efficient. Yes, yes. Um, you can sh you can show people what you're working on. You can all see each other's each other's notes or papers. And if you're if you get really proficient at it, you've got a whiteboard, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I, I really see it as being a huge advance. Yet at the same time, look how many people are saying, "Oh, I hate Zoom meetings. I can't stand them." And I'm kind of going, "I I don't quite get that. I I think yeah. it's pretty good." Yeah, I do too. I, I, think I think it's a big improvement from from before. A lot more efficient use of your time. Mm -hmm. You know, I think I think one of the interesting things. Uh, you know, we were all forced to go to Zoom. You know, with uh, with COVID, the truth is many of us have stayed with Zoom because, as you just pointed out, Ed, it's so efficient and it, it does address the second challenge. You can, in fact, you know, spend the lunchtime and get everybody together at a lunchtime when nobody has to leave, and you can accomplish an enormous amount of business without ever walking away from your desk. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And you, and and you can, if you were really wild and crazy, and, and many of our small business people are, I mean, you can have eight meetings a day. Yeah, you yeah. can. And instead of two. Absolutely. In R3. So, so, I mean, it, it makes a huge difference in terms of efficiency. I think it's a, it's a wonderful idea for startups to be able to build things around these kinds of meetings. But then having said that, what do you guys think about sort of the meet and greet, you know, plus press the flesh kind of thing where you get to know people a little bit better and you build relationships better I'm thinking that it's the sales people who don't like it as much because and, and the people who are more outgoing extroverted who like people and they just want to get together. I'm not sure it's an efficiency problem. I think it's a personality issue. What do you guys think? Well, I, I think I, it could be a personality type of a situation. However, um, I, I think it all always comes down to balance, and I, I think you need to do both. Um, but I think you can be more selective on the physical meetings that you attend mm -hmm. and uh, make sure you're just you're, you're going there to develop a relationship with somebody rather than just showing up and um, not really doing anything with anybody. Right. So I, I think it's a balancing thing. I think you need both. But I but the Zoom is a big advantage for making it possible to have a lot of meetings during one day. And if you're a salesperson, if you can line these things up, you can make a lot more calls a day than you could the other way. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I agree. The uh, Some of the behavior is different. My sense is that the buyer side of the world um, has been able to protect themselves from drop-ins uh, and salespeople who use an inordinate amount of their time up and being able to, you know, to give somebody a little bit of time without, without taking a, you know, a half a day is, is interesting. It, it, it is a challenge for people who sell one time things, you know, it's like, I'd like to come in and sell you this one thing and, and I, I probably won't see you again because you only buy one of these things every X period of time. So, I mean, I can see where there is a group that it, it's tough, but for relationship building, the issue really, I think, has to do with being more relevant. The reason, the reason that in house uh, or you know, in-person meetings have worked is because it was really the only way we had to get to know new people. But if you provide information that is interesting to people, you can get to know them. Um, my, my wife, uh, who does a lot of these, as you know, from the Manufacturing Council, uh, has had a lot of people come up to her who have said, um, oh, I know who you are because I've sat in on some of your your uh, manufacturing council meetings, and she's just blown away. Like, really? I mean, I, I didn't I didn't know that. Thank you very much. That kind of thing. So you see, when they did run into each other at another type of event, there was a relationship to an extent that was developed there. I'm not sure that it's so. The issue is how we use this, not 
that we have to have a lot more in-person meetings. It's just another yeah, tool in the toolbox, that's yeah. for sure. Let, let me make an observation that I think is that this new world has opened up that, that wasn't available. And it's kind of a combination between one, uh, transitioning to digital and two, networking. Now, you know, today, literally, we could have a Zoom meeting with people who would normally be a competitor, but they're in a different region or a different location. And you can talk about strategies as to how to grow your business without really jeopardizing your particular area. You yeah, know, so exactly. in my mind, this becomes a very powerful way to grow your business that wasn't available to us uh, two or three years ago. Absolutely. <clears throat> the next topic, sir. Uh, yeah, uh, this is this is in your corner, uh, Ed. You know, you've been uh, beating this drum since I've known you, which is forward planning. Um, and it's saying here that forward planning for most small businesses is difficult for the very reasons we were just talking about. But, you know, given your experience, Ed, why do you think these small businesses are so poor at forward planning? Well, the first thing is they're so focused on getting the job done each and every day that they don't have the time to think outside the box. I think that's the majority of the uh, problems associated with forward thinking. And second of all, people that you hire for some for the for key financial positions are more of a bookkeeper type and they're not used to doing projections their focus is closing the books mm. and um and, and quite frankly a lot of times it's hard to get the owners in a room to even review the financial statements on a monthly basis so <laughs> i mean yeah. it's just yeah. like everything is against you yeah but the opportunity is to focus on the future and if you don't focus on the future, you're just going day by day and you don't know what type of uh, challenges you're going to have that you're going to have to think outside the box. I, I like doing the forecasting into the future. I like to have evaluation done every year uh, based upon those numbers. I'd like to have everybody involved on what the strategic issues that everybody's working on and have progress associated with each one of those people associated with the plan so that there's full accountability into the future. But we focus always on the past because I guess it's easier to do. Well, it's yeah. the tyranny of the urgent, isn't it? Um, yeah. And I, and I think that, the, that it's probably safe to say, you guys can disagree if you, if you see some way to do that, but I think that those people who don't do any planning Tend to, tend to be such poor planners that they can't even figure out what they're going to do for the day, and they they allow interruptions to come in and rule their world, uh, and or they have to do everything themselves, and therefore they, and they haven't allocated enough time, and they and they just don't do anything at all, and therefore it just stays the tyranny of the urgent, and that's where their lives live. Right. Personally, I can't live like that. So I have to have that structure. I'm not, I wasn't, you know, when I was a young, younger entrepreneur, I was probably just as crazy as everybody else in terms of doing too many things and, and not being able to plan time well and not getting everything done because I was the only one, all of that stuff. But, but the only way out of the tyranny of the urgent is through planning. That's, I yeah. think that's its only salvation. And I, I want to do say one thing related to HR. I, I think take a look at job descriptions for jobs that are that people are looking for. And and I guess and I and I would venture to say almost all the tasks that they're looking for are in the past. And very little forward thinking is involved in trying to hire anybody. Right. So I mean, when I was uh, growing up through the chairs of financial responsibility. Uh, it was all based upon uh, closing the books, closing the books and having accurate financial information uh, at that point in time was foremost. Yeah. But what we found shortly thereafter, the value is not that. That can be done uh, rather uh, economically now. The true value is looking into the future and trying to figure out how you're going to grow the company and reduce risk. Right. Well, I, I think, think it's a, yeah, just a, just a, a note now, and then you finish it up, um, Ray. 
the, have you noticed how many big companies have a future CFO, meaning um, uh, chief future officer now? Well, that, I think they're on track. I think that's yeah. what you need. I, I I didn't see that. I haven't noticed. I'd love to see a job description like that. There's there's just a whole lot of that. Um, it, I mean, and I think Bloomberg in particular just likes to interview those kinds of people. But I think that's a page a page that an entrepreneur might go, oh well, if the big companies think that it's worth some big well paid job to have a future officer, maybe at least I had to go get a baseball hat, you know, and put on my future planning hat occasionally. Yeah, right. Right. No, no, I, you know, I agree. <laughs> I, I think the, uh, the the challenge is we've talked about is because small businesses are typically under managed uh, or they don't have enough resources, you know, and so you know, to set aside the time for future planning when, as you pointed out, well, I know what my financials said, I'm okay, as opposed to saying, you know, how do these financials relate to where we're trying to get to? And and do I need to make some adjustments to make sure that we reach that goal in the next quarter or next year, whatever we have? Right. So, you know, that's that's the urgency that you're talking about. There needs to be an urgency about forward planning, just as there needs to be an urgency about what do we got to get done today? Absolutely. Right. right. So uh, this one is kind of a surprise to me, and I don't know that it's a challenge, for, at least for us, it's leaving brick and mortar. Yeah. Uh, I'm just going to make a comment. I, I just, I haven't, I haven't been in a brick and mortar in my entire business career. I think it's, uh, it's overrated. So I, <laughs> you've been homeless. Think. We've been homeless. That's right. <laughs> well, I think it's funny that, uh, um, I think, you know, as a, as a, when I was in the retail business, of course, you, you got to yeah. have brick and mortar, but um, uh, you don't now. You certainly, you did then, but you don't now. And um, I think then in other businesses that I, that I've started just by myself and, not, you know, I can hardly wait to be able to have the status of having an office. It's like, well, you're big enough now to where you know you, you actually have employees and so you, they need to have a place to work well that's not true anymore and today you know we're completely virtual right. um so um i don't see that necessarily as a problem uh however if you listen to two to very many people in the reit reit the business for offices especially big buildings in big cities uh there are a lot of guys freaking out about what are they going to do with all this oh. extra office space. So, of course, those are big companies. They don't really affect a small company very much. I don't, I don't see that that's a that big of a problem either for uh, for smaller companies. If they want to go virtual, <clears throat> they just put together some some systems that are accessible online and uh, and get Zoom, and you got it. Right. Yeah, no, and, and it's or slack or so many other so many other things out. there. Right. And it's so much more cost effective, you know, I mean, and I think the point to your point, there are sometimes people who have this, this need to have an office to to either swipe, uh, assuage their ego or whatever, you know, hey, I have an office location, but you know, it, it really doesn't add any practical value to a business, you know, I, I when I stop and think about how many walk-ins do you have you know if you're selling furniture yes that's a, that's a major issue yeah but if you're selling consulting services do you need an office <laughs> yeah right that's right you don't all right so let's move to the fifth one and uh and i think this is really kind of ties it all together but it's how do you um assume or get better about work-life balance because it's an area where uh i think I know I've suffered from uh, lack of balance in the past, and I'm sure you two both have, have at some point or another in your career, you know, not been able to spend as much time with your family as you may have wanted. Yeah, clearly, I, I think that's true. And um, I, I've always, I don't know if this is right, but I've always had the attitude, if the business isn't healthy, the family's not gonna be healthy because they're gonna be starving. Right. Um, and so it's really important to understand that if you're if you're being supported by a business and many can't really start that way because they haven't saved enough money to have the capital and therefore, you know, one of one of the two spouses is working to support the other one and that kind of thing. But if you really have a business and that business is going to support you, um, you better you better be successful in the business. 
therefore you, uh, you, you better make it work. And therefore you, you should be better at planning maybe and right. some of these systems and or take more time getting things ready before you actually launch it. Um, but you have to make that work. And so I don't think I ever abused my family, but uh, there were an awful lot of times when I worked 12 and 14 hours a day. And um, the way I did it was I always, I always made it home for dinner. Right. I think that's that. I think that that was it. You know, um, never never missed a football game or or a, you know soccer game. Never never did that. But I was working before the game, and I many times worked after the game if it was on a Saturday. Right. Um, so I did them both, but the work was constant and continual around the the family things that I that I had to attend, and then of course dinner was the number one thing. Um, oddly, oddly enough, my wife's doctor, when we, when our first child was born, said, he, when trying to get some, you know, what are the tips on raising a kid? And he said, the number one success factor in families is having dinner together. Yeah, cool. And she, she took that, she took that, you know, for verbatim, and we lived our lives that way. So there were times when we had dinner at one of my stores. Okay, hmm. so it becomes a real family thing, right? Right. But the family's got to support it, which I have said many times in terms of the requirements to start into business. If your spouse is not on board with how this is going to be, don't start the business. Yeah, that's the quickest way to divorce, which is one of the five D's we talked about. That's right. That's, right. that's exactly right. Um, um, from my perspective, um, focusing on the business is extremely important. That's what Ron mentioned first. Um, but I also believe there's tremendous value in planning. And if you're just focusing on the business, you're missing out on a big opportunity to grow your business and reduce risk. So one of the things you have to learn to do is delegate. And delegating uh, activities is not always easy for many because a lot of people are perfectionists, and when they delegate an act, uh, a activity, they'll give you a 20-page report of 150 items that you have to do a certain way to get it done. And, and we all know <laughs> that's not always the case. You have to give people the ability to do it this differently and accomplish the same type of goals and objectives. So delegation is extremely important. And if you're a business owner that's trying to do everything yourself and you're afraid to delegate, there's only so much business you can do. You might as well forget about the future and trying to improve the value of the business because you don't have the time to do so. Mm -hmm. And the balancing at home is extremely important because if you don't balance everything at home along with your business, you're going to have challenges there also. You know, and I was going to say, I don't know if this is a kind of a wrap up, but whatever. But when you look at the first four challenges, they kind of all connect together into the last one, which is work life balance. If you're really effective at digital stuff, if you're able to network and use these uh, tools like Zoom, if you can already consistently forward plan, you know, your work life balance becomes less of a problem. And, and as um, you pointed out, Ron, you know, I, the success of the business determines the success of the family because if you fail at business then you have no way to feed the family so they're you know they're they're, they're deeply linked and you know with small businesses it's always a balance act and the more effective we can do those first four uh the more likely we're not going to deal with the lack of work-life balance number five right that's right and we, we've spoken we've spoken of this as well i think you both mentioned delegation again today but but the the purpose of the owner of the business is should be the goal should be not to do any work. And, yeah, absolutely. And so if you have the attitude, we've talked about you have to have this attitude in the family business that you focus on the profit. And by the same token, you if you're the owner of a of an entrepreneurship and it's a small, very small company, the attitude is I, I'm going to do as little as I need to in order to achieve the goals. Not that you're not going to work, but but you have to be able to do the administration in a short period of time. 
Yeah, you're going to earn yeah, so yeah. much money, more money using your brain yeah. than right. using your back. Good point. Good right. point. So yeah. if you do it all yourself, it's going to be a problem. And to that, I'll, I'll, I'll just say, yeah, it really does wrap up. If, you pl- if you're new in business, your plan for how you're going to grow helps you do the, the work-life balance. Right. If you don't plan enough labor, like I'm just going to do everything, you end up never getting out of the hole. If, yeah. if you're a, a one-man band, you know, you got to learn how to play every instrument. It's going to take a lot more time. Right, right. <laughs> and you be better you if you drop a drumstick. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, and so you better already know how to play every single instrument before you start. Yeah, yeah. You don't learn to pick up the trombone, you know, you know, when you're in the middle of the song. I mean, you, you have to have that nailed. That planning is a big, big deal. And people should take years planning to make sure they've got it right and that they have the money in, in there, the growth plan the facilities play everything has to be really nailed now the irony is as we've we've also talked so much about is new entrepreneurs are not the detail people they're the idea people right. so right. how do you you know you have right. to get that together and you're going to have to do some of this stuff whether you like it or not you're right and and you know building something is not the same as running something and i think that's uh, you know one of the major challenges you well, guys, I think this has been a, an interesting conversation. I hope that people, uh, our, our, our audience is really enjoying this. I know I had, I, it was a lot of fun today. Um, anything else we want to do to wrap it up? Or do we want to go on with our conversation next week, Ron? And, and if so, uh, should we invite John in so that sure. uh, we can keep going? Mm-hmm. You bet. I'll, I would I'll, just challenge I'll, in ending this call. I would challenge every business owner to call a meeting with their key people and hopefully somebody from the outside to focus on planning the future. Get it started. There we go. You get started. It ain't going to happen. Yeah. Good way to summarize it. Thank you, Ed.